Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here with you on this first day of the week, getting ready for another short Bible study this Sunday afternoon. We're going to focus today on a narrative expository study, unlike the character studies that we did the last two weeks. We're going to do a narrative expository study focusing on Jesus' baptism. And to remind you, an expository study is a verse-by-verse -verse study where we are going to try and extrapolate some truths relating to, in this case, a doctrinal truth, which would be baptism. But this is also a narrative study seeking to find context and also extrapolate some derivatives to understand this passage, this event, in this case, Jesus' baptism. Some considerable time has passed since Jesus' birth. How old was Jesus when he started his ministry? Luke 3, 23 tells us that he was 30 years of age. So the last time a gospel author told us something about Jesus, he was 12 years old, and that was Luke. Now we jump all the way till he is 30 years old. And why? 30. Interesting number to pick, but it's not so mysterious since uh, the Mosaic Law in Numbers 4.23, also Numbers 4.47, uh, only priests who were third, between 30 and 55 were eligible for service as priests. So since Jesus was beginning his ministry, uh, he, it was appropriate for him to begin when he was 30. Also, it was customary in that culture to consider somebody mature by the time they were 30 years old. So the event we're looking at today is what launched Jesus into his ministry. This is the starting point, so to speak. And you can uh, read with me in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. We're going to read from God's word version. Then Jesus appeared. He came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? Jesus answered him, this is the way it has to be now. This is the proper way to do everything that God requires of us. Then John gave in to him. After Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God coming down as a dove to him. Then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, my son with whom I am well pleased. So in this passage, looking at this verse by verse, we see that Jesus suddenly appears, the text says. He appeared. Where was he? What was he doing before? We don't know. He just appeared there when John was baptizing by the river. We can only speculate, and many historians and other theologians have speculated, well, what was Jesus doing all this time? Well, we don't really know. We can speculate, but the more important question to examine today as we look at this text is the how, the why, and the when of this particular event of baptism, because that is what the gospel writers paid attention to. They didn't necessarily pay too much attention to Jesus' prior years. Only Luke gave us that little tidbit about Jesus getting lost in Jerusalem, or maybe his parents were the one that got lost. Jesus knew where he was. But all the gospel writers are all in accord with these events that occurred when Jesus was baptized, and they all mention the things that we see in Matthew. So let's, we just read about the how of this event. John didn't think it was necessary for Jesus to get baptized, but we will see in a bit that John wasn't entirely convinced of who Jesus was. Yes, he knew he was his cousin, they were family, but John didn't really know that Jesus was the Messiah until later on. And we're going to read a verse in John that will clarify that for us. But 
But Jesus said, look, we need to do this because this is what God requires. It's not what we may think we need to do, but is what God requires for us to do. So we can see here how Jesus was always in keeping with God's command. And, and how was Jesus baptized? Well, the how here is quite simple. We, knew, we know he was baptized by immersion in water in keeping with what God wanted him to do. This is how John the baptizer baptized people. So that's the how. And of course, John tries to stop Jesus. He says, I need to be baptized by you. Wouldn't it be great if we got that response from more people? I need to be baptized by you. Uh, that's not a common response. But Jesus just wanted to do what the Father wanted him to do. So let's think about the why now. Why of Jesus' baptism? Because even John said, even if John at this point wasn't quite sure that Jesus was the Messiah, he kind of recognized some things in Jesus. Sometimes I wonder, well, what, what did he recognize in Jesus that led him to say these things? Um, so let's understand that we would probably agree with John that Jesus didn't need to repent, did he? I mean, John's baptism was a baptism for repentance, the Bible says. Jesus didn't need to repent of anything. And also, had, did Jesus need to have his sins forgiven? No. <laughs> and John's baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus didn't meet those two requirements. He had nothing to repent of. He had no sins that he needed to have forgiven. So maybe we would be in agreement with John and saying, wait a minute, Jesus, what? we're the ones that need to be baptized by you, yet you want to be baptized? So why then was he baptized? Well, Jesus tells us why. Um, John had a purpose in God's plan that we know. Uh, Isaiah talked about John at some point. Malachi brings him up again as the person that was going to be sent to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. So we know God had a plan in John, and the plan was revealed that he was going to baptize people for repentance, for forgiveness of sins, to prepare the way for the master. And as we see here in Luke chapter 7, verse 30, the Pharisees and the experts in Moses' teachings had rejected that plan for them. In other words, they refused to be baptized by John. They didn't recognize John as that part of God's plan. However, Jesus did recognize that John was part of God's plan. And that's why he said to John, this is what we must do. And even though Jesus may not have had a need for the baptism, we see him wanting to be in full compliance and wanting to be part of the God's plan and not leave a doubt in anybody's mind that he was there to fulfill the plans of the Father. John's baptism was from heaven in a debate that Jesus had with the Pharisees. He asked them this question. He said, did John's right to baptize came from heaven or did it come from humans? Because people were disputing whether or not John the baptizer was indeed a prophet sent by God. And we know how this went down, right? They discussed among themselves, well, you know, if we say that it was from heaven, then he's going to ask us, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say it was from men, then they were afraid that the people were going to stone them. So they, what did they say to Jesus? We don't know. <laughs> and so Jesus said, then I'm not going to give you an answer either to your question. So we believe in this question and how he posed this question to the Pharisees. We also believe that Jesus believed that John's baptism had God's authority, and Jesus wanted to submit to God's authority, which is why he was baptized. He wanted to submit to God's authority. Also, we know from John chapter 6, verse 38, 
that he didn't come from heaven to do what he wanted to do. But Jesus says, I've come to do what the one who sent me wants me to do. And that is the Father. So the threefold reason of why was Jesus baptized. We can list them right here. And this, of course, can be summarized in what he told John to fulfill all righteousness, which basically means we need to do the right thing. Even though what you might say is right, that there's no sins Jesus needed to repent of, no sins he needed to be forgiven of, he wanted to fulfill all righteousness. He wanted to do the proper thing. He didn't need baptism, but he needed to make things right as an example to us. Because in doing this and in starting his ministry in this way, he was showing us the way to start our walk with him. It begins with that death to self, that is baptism, in surrendering to God's will and recognizing that, yes, this is part of God's plan. I believe this is the plan God has for me. And in baptism, we surrender to that plan and we die to the self when we do that. So he was, he was showing us the way to follow him in doing this. Let's talk about the when. We talked about the how. We talked about the why. Let's talk about the when. When I say when, you might think that I may be talking like if I asked somebody, well, when were you baptized? And typically we think of an age. Oh, well, I was baptized when I was 20 years old. That's when I was baptized. Uh, or maybe when I reached an understanding of why I needed to take the plunge. But this when is a little different. I'm talking about what happened when Jesus was baptized, because that's what all the gospel writers focus on. The fact that he was baptized by John is one thing, but the big when, when Jesus came out of the water, something huge happened. And that's the when that the gospel writers pay attention to. When people get baptized, you've seen it many times. I've seen it in my own pool. They get baptized and when they come out of the water, sometimes they're cold, they're shivering. Uh, they're, of course, wet and we have to give them a towel. Um, and they're joyful. You know, they did something great. They feel free. They feel joyful. But something different happened with Jesus. When he got baptized, it was not like the rest of the people that John was baptizing. And this is what distinguishes his baptism from all the others that have occurred since that time. God's Spirit descended on him as a dove. Very important distinction. Not saying that the Holy Spirit looked like a dove, and oftentimes, even in this illustration, and you see it all over the internet, why do people use the symbol of a dove to represent the Holy Spirit? Because maybe they read a little too much into it. But in the Greek, it's very clear that the Holy Spirit came on him as a bird would land on a person. That's the simile made right there. Not that the Holy Spirit turned into a dove and they saw a dove landing on John. That's not what it says. The Holy Spirit was made manifest in such a way that people saw something descending upon Jesus, something Maybe like a bird would come and land on you. It's an indication of how the Spirit would come down on believers. Jesus first had to be had to suffer and have to be raised and have to go to heaven in order for him to send the Spirit. We know that. But here in this case, God made, a, made it manifest. He made it visible. And not just visible, but audible. Because there was also a voice from heaven that everyone heard. Some people said it sounded like thunder. Saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, if you stop and think, well, what's the point of all this? Why did God make the spirit manifest at that point for everyone to see? And why did he say something for everyone to hear? Now, we know usually in the past when God 
decides to do something like this, he doesn't do it all the time. It must be pretty special. Something very special must be going on in order for God to make himself manifest in this way. And it was for the benefit, not only for the benefit of those present, as we read in the Gospels many times when they heard the voice of God speaking or something happening, even Jesus himself said, that voice that you hear was not for my benefit, but for yours, Jesus will say. But not just for the benefit of those present, but even for our benefit as we read this testimony 2,000 and some years later. It's for our benefit as well, knowing that something special happened that day. Understanding that the Father was very pleased with Jesus and he wanted everybody to know, this is my son. In another occasion in the transfiguration, and I'm sure we're going to get to that at some point this year, he said something a little different. His voice was manifested as well, but he said, listen to him. <laughs> That's what he was telling in particular the disciples that went with Jesus up to the mountain when he was transfigured. So God is signaling him out before everybody there. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. We get vocal confirmation this time and again later on in the transformation. Notice also something interesting here. How each person of the Godhead is involved in this manifestation. Of course, we can see the Son, Jesus. He was there in bodily form in the flesh. But then we see the Father. We don't see the Father. We hear the Father's voice. And we see the Holy Spirit is made manifest at the same time. So all three persons of the Godhead make themselves manifest at this point particular point in time when Jesus is launching his ministry. It's, it's like saying, okay, this has God's approval. This has God's seal of approval. And God manifests himself. Prior to this event, like I said before, John maybe could have guessed that Jesus was the Messiah. But after this, after this manifestation was made evident, he did not doubt, <laughs> neither he nor others that were present there. And I'll let John explain further. We're going to read from John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34, where we're reading what John the baptizer said. This is him speaking in, in this verse. It says, John saw Jesus coming toward him the next day and said, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I spoke about when I said, a man who comes after me was before me because he existed before I did. I didn't know who he was. However, I came to baptize with water to show him to the people of Israel. John said, I saw the Spirit come down as a dove from heaven and stay on him. I didn't know who he was, but God who sent me to baptize with water had told me, when you see the Spirit come down and stay on someone, you'll know that person is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen this and have declared that this is the Son of God. So at this point, when Jesus is baptized, and his sonship is manifested, John's ministry was fulfilled. Because that's what he was sent to do. To prepare the people, but at the same time to usher in the Messiah. To show everybody, to show all of Israel who this Messiah was. And John, we've got confirmation from him. This is, this is what I witnessed. This is what I saw. So that makes me think that you know, in their years together, I don't know how many times they got together because they lived in different towns, but I'm sure they got together. I'm sure John knew that Jesus was his cousin up until the time when John was called by the Spirit to live in the wilderness before he was called to baptize. So maybe he thought that Jesus was special. Maybe he had been told the stories of the virgin birth and all these things, and they kind of knew, well, you know, Jesus is a special person, but he didn't quite know. He says, I didn't know until, until I saw the Spirit 
be on him. And now I can tell you, this is the one. This is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so God, we see God, God doesn't want anyone to doubt who his beloved son is. It was clear 2,000 years ago. God clarified it, not just at this time, but many times through the signs and wonders that Jesus performed, continually showing the world who he was, and not just the world. But now when we read these words, when we read the testimony of these people, of the first evangelists and witnesses, we ourselves can come to the same conclusion. After all, the Apostle John, when he writes the Gospel of John in chapter 20, he says, I have written this so that you may believe, so that we can get the faith necessary to believe in Christ because of these things that happen. Just because the signs that God gave and that Jesus performed occurred 2,000 years ago, just because it occurred so long ago, that doesn't mean they are diminished in the least of their importance or their significance in our lives today 2,000 years later. And to ignore them would be to ignore them to our peril. Do we ignore facts just because they are old? Well, those who are doomed to repeat history are the ones who do. <laughs> so the purpose of Jesus' baptism. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. God wanted to point out who the Messiah was so that no one would doubt. God wanted the beginning of Jesus' ministry to be clear to all who were there, especially to John, because that would fulfill his ministry. We know that Jesus is our front runner, our trailblazer. He ran ahead of us. He completed the course and is now waiting for us at the altar in heaven as we walk in his footsteps. And so this beginning of the ministry, which lasted three years until he was crucified, he is pointing out to us the way that we should run this trail so that we don't doubt. He wants everyone to know how to start out. Jesus sets the pace. He says, this is the right thing to do. How do we start out? We start out at baptism. We start out by doing the things that would please God because that's what Jesus wanted to do, to be devoted to God. He wants to point out the goodness of God for us, the love of God. And Jesus is the embodiment of God's mercy and his forgiving love that we so desperately need. Only by Jesus' work on the cross can we find the way to this abundant life here and in the hereafter. And although Jesus didn't need baptism, we sure do. <laughs> we sure need this balm for our soul. Jesus wanted to fulfill all righteousness. He didn't want to put himself above God's law. He didn't want to seem like, well, well, you know, I don't need to do this, John, so you can skip me and just continue baptizing the rest of the people. No, we see God's attitude and even submitting himself to the very law that he made, the Mosaic law, which we knew that was one of the purposes of his ministry, to fulfill the law so that now the law wouldn't apply to us but instead, we would be judged by God's mercy. How awesome is that? So are any, of us, are any of us above God's righteous requirement? If Jesus didn't think himself above the requirement of needing to be baptized by John, who in the world can think that they are above that? No, we're actually way below. We're way below the bar, which thankfully... God set low enough for us in order to be able to fulfill all the righteous requirements in Jesus Christ by following him in this manner. Not any one of our righteous acts could even begin to undo our sin, which is why Jesus embarked on his journey to become that Lamb of God. As John said, look, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world to undo the disobedience of mankind. So when we join Jesus in this death, burial, and resurrection by baptism, we begin also a new journey as Jesus did 
when he was baptized. One full of pitfalls, one full of many trials and temptations, but also full of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So why should you be baptized? Why should I be baptized? We examine why Jesus was baptized, but what, why should we? Well, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Have you sinned? Is there anyone here can, who can raise their hand and say, I have never sinned? If you're 10 years or younger, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> who needs empowerment? If you are a person who has sinned, if you are a person that you think you need some kind of power to keep moving through this life, then you should be joyful that you can receive the Spirit of God. Even Jesus himself needed the Holy Spirit in order to embark on the journey. What was the first place that he went to after being baptized? <laughs> to be tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. Yes, right after such a joyous occasion, temptation begins quite quickly. But that's why God empowers us with the Holy Spirit. We need our sins washed away. We need to be born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus, to see the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. And we need empowerment. Not, an empower, not a physical kind of empowerment, because that comes to nothing eventually, but an empowerment that is going to last to the next age for you, to make it through this life and in the next one. This, this is God's will. As Jesus recognized, John's baptism was part of God's plan, the will of God. So we too, as his church and as people who want to be led by God, need to recognize this is God's will. And it works only when we have that same attitude that Jesus and John had a heart to really want to do the will of the Father. Baptism works. These things happen. You will be forgiven of your sin. You will receive the Holy Spirit. That happens when you do it because you want to please the Father, because you believe in the Father, and because you have a desire to belong to God's kingdom. I pray that you follow in these, in these footsteps of Jesus Christ to begin your journey today if you haven't done so. God bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want you to imagine for a minute going into the hospital for a minor surgery procedure. Maybe to have your tonsils removed or fix a broken bone. You wake up from that surgery and you feel a pain in your side. And the doctor comes in and says, we're really sorry, but we accidentally removed your kidney. As bizarre as that may sound, it's something that happens all the time. Uh, wrong side surgery, left instead of right. Wrong site surgery. Neurosurgeons are often known to operate on the wrong level of the spine. Wrong procedure, even wrong patient surgery. There's a famous case where a, a patient got a major heart surgery done. Um, and it was mistaken, a mistaken patient because he had a similar last name to another patient in the hospital. Fortunately, it happens a lot less today, thanks in large part to um, Atul Gawande, maybe butchering his name, but uh, in his book, uh, The Checklist Manifesto, Gawande shows doctors how to save lives in surgery by using a checklist. Um, in his checklist, there are three vital pause points, one before anesthesia is given, one before the incision is done, and one before leaving the operating room. Um, each one of the pause points is just less than a minute, just long enough for them to go through some uh, basic vital checks. And as a result, in 2008, eight hospitals implemented this checklist. And after a few months, there was a reduction in 35% of major complications and 47% in deaths. So what an amazing difference that was brought about by surgical teams taking the time to pause during their procedures. And my understanding from speaking to a brother that works in the operating room now, pretty much all hospitals use this. It's widespread. They may not use his exact one, but they all use some sort of checklist. So 
if man could see the importance of using pauses to save physical lives, how about our spiritual lives? How about spiritual pause points? Well, God knows the importance of pausing, of spiritual pause points. When he delivered his people from Egyptian bondage, he gave them a pause point, the Sabbath, a day of rest to remember the Lord God. And we're here today on this first day of the week to remember and reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't this a pause point that was established by Jesus? Well, I want to take a look at the most important pause point that there is. If you would turn with me over to Matthew chapter 11, we'll read verses 28 through 30. And it reads, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wanted to share this passage this afternoon in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for our sins, to encourage us and remind us of the ultimate pause, the ultimate rest that we have only through Jesus Christ. The rest that Jesus personally invites us into is not a physical rest. I know we have many brothers and sisters here that may be weary and tired. Maybe you work the overnight shift, maybe a double shift. I know for me, even when I come back from vacation, I'm still physically tired, right? So it's not a physical rest that he's offering. What he's offering us is a rest for our souls. When Jesus says, come to me and you, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest, he's talking about salvation, an eternal rest, not one that wears off after taking a nap. You know, you wake up refreshed, but a few hours later, you're tired again. That's not the type of rest that he's offering us here. All of us were weary and worn out from the burden of sin and guilt and not knowing what our eternal destiny was. But once we received the free gift and closed ourselves to Christ, we were able to enter his eternal rest, giving us peace with God, a clear conscience, and the removal of our guilt. And Jesus is able to offer us this rest because of his perfect life, because of his death on the cross, and because of his resurrection. And God is able to say, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more, as we see in Jeremiah 31, 34. Jesus says also here in this verse that his yoke is easy. That may be confusing to us because we know the Christian life is not necessarily an easy life. But you have to see the kindness in this. In fact, the Greek word for easy is kind. And Jesus is kind to us. His burden is kind. And his kindness is seen most clearly on the cross. We were weary and burdened by sin. We could never obey God completely and fully. So Jesus came. He left the heavenly realm. And he came as our substitute. He lived on life, a perfect life on earth, obedient to God, even to the point of death on a cross. And because of that death, because of the innocent blood that was shed on the cross, he is able to faithfully offer us rest. And the wrath of God, which we are owed and which we deserve, has been fully satisfied by Jesus Christ on the cross. He paid it all. All that we deserve was given to him. And even though he earned that rest, he graciously gives it to us if we would just come to him. As I walked around the building here um, it was a couple of months ago, um, I saw a brother, a new brother, that was um, just sitting in a row by himself, quietly. So I said, let me go over to encourage him. And in conversation, um, the brother said that I'm just sitting here for a few minutes just to focus my heart and mind before the Lord's Supper. That was encouraging and also convicting because I know oftentimes we come here to service and we just bring the baggage and all the weariness and troubles of the week with us and we don't take time to focus our hearts and minds for this time. So I want to encourage us to do that now as Jesus encourages us to do. Sometimes the most important thing to do is just to stop. Stop what you're doing, stop what you're saying and to focus on the cross of Christ. First Corinthians also says that we should examine ourselves at this time. So I want to do that now. Before we take the Lord's Supper, before we go into prayer, I want to just take a brief 60 seconds or so just for us to pause and to reflect, to remember Jesus Christ on the cross, and remember that it's our sin that put him there. Our sin yesterday, our sin today, our sin that we'll commit tomorrow, that is what crucified Christ. 
the weed that of the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And the surround the throne. And the surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. The children of the heavenly king, the children of the heavenly king, they speak their joys abroad, they speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion is a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, or oh, walk the golden streets, or oh, walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let us homes abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fair wells on high, to fair wells on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God.